late 1800s, Russian physiologist Ivan Pavlov was studying the salivary response in dogs. To get the dogs to drool on cue, Pavlov presented them with meat powder. Mmm, yummy. But Pavlov noticed that over time, annoyingly, that dogs would start salivating as soon as they saw him, well before they were given the meat powder. Pavlov theorised that the dogs were learning to associate the sight of him and the experience of the meat powder. This observation would springboard an entire sub-discipline of psychology, behaviourism. Being a good scientist, Pavlov designed an empirical experiment to test his learned association theory. In a procedure known as Pavlovian conditioning or classical conditioning, Pavlov paired the sound of a bell with the food. The food is called the unconditioned stimulus because dogs don't need to learn to salivate when they see and smell food, it's just a natural biological reaction, which is itself known as the unconditioned response. After a number of bell food pairings, the dogs began to salivate whenever they heard the bell. Now because the dogs must experience repeated conditioning events in order to learn this association, the bell is referred to as the conditioned stimulus. When the dogs reliably salivate to the sound of the bell and there's no food present, the salivation response is referred to as the conditioned response. Now if all of that seemed a bit like word salad, we're going to come back to these terms over and over again throughout the course, so don't worry. Pavlov also discovered that the conditioned response would not continue indefinitely. If he continued to present the sound of the bell over and over again with no food, the dogs would eventually stop drooling when they heard the bell. This technique is known as extinction. Before Pavlov's time, psychology was pretty unscientific. Psychodynamic practices relied on methods like free association that would produce inconsistent results. For example, if patients were asked to say the first word that popped into their head when they heard the word walrus, they could provide completely different answers even if they were just asked the same question. In scientific terms, this is known as low test retest reliability. Psychodynamic methods also rely heavily on the therapist's interpretation. And so while one therapist may say that thumb sucking is caused by not enough breastfeeding as a baby, another may say that the exact same thumb sucking was caused by too much breastfeeding or by being bottle fed or who knows what else. This method would be said to lack inter-rater reliability. There's also no way to verify if these methods actually tap into a person's unconscious. Did a person dream of being swallowed by a whale because they were afraid of their domineering boss or because they were reading Moby Dick just before bed? This technique would be said to lack validity. The concept of ensuring that you're measuring what you think you're measuring. Another person who used the scientific method to advance psychology was John B. Watson. Watson wanted to see if classical conditioning methods could make someone learn to fear a previously unfeared object. In his famous and completely unethical experiments, Watson brought 11-month-old Little Albert into the lab. Little Albert's favourite toy was a fluffy white rat. In the experiment, Watson gave Albert his rat to play with and then made a sudden loud noise behind him making Albert cry. After just five pairings of the rat with the scary noise, Albert was already showing signs of fear towards the previously adored toy. This fear also spread to anything white and fluffy such as a Santa Claus beard. This spreading of a learned association is known as stimulus generalisation. One of Watson's students, Mary Cover-Jones, wanted to see if Pavlov's extinction technique would help to alleviate the learned fear response. Jones brought a boy named Peter into the lab who was coincidentally afraid of fluffy white objects also. Jones put Peter in a room with a number of other children and lots of toys, including the white rabbit. With gradual exposure, Peter's fear of the white rabbit reduced until the point where he would happily play with the rabbit himself. Jones contacted Peter many years later and found that his fear of fluffy white things had not returned. Jones had developed the first successful treatment for phobias. What made classical conditioning experiments so valuable is that their methods were measurable and replicable. This meant that Jones could apply the same technique that Pavlov used many years earlier 
and get the exact same result, the extinction of the conditioned response. Burroughs Frederick Skinner was another pioneer who believed that psychology needed to be studied using the scientific method. He spent much of his career researching a different type of associative learning called operant or instrumental conditioning. Skinner's work was heavily influenced by Edward Thorndike's Law of Effect, which states that the consequence of a behaviour influences whether it is performed more or less frequently in the future. So if a toddler bites their sibling and is scolded as a consequence, the Law of Effect states that the toddler is unlikely to do this behaviour again. Similarly, if you praise a dog when it pees outside, then the dog's going to pee outside more often because it associates peeing outside with being told that you're a good dog and we like that. Skinner described four different behaviour consequence situations. When the frequency of the behaviour increases, the consequence is referred to as a reinforcer. There are two different types of reinforcement. In the situation where the dog pees outside and gets praised as a consequence, praise functions as positive reinforcement. Negative reinforcement works a little bit differently. You can think of negative reinforcement as something bad or annoying being taken away to increase the frequency of a behavior. So you know that annoying beeping sound that your car makes when you haven't put your seat belt on? Well, that annoying beep gets taken away when you perform the behavior of putting your seat belt on. Because the removal of the sound increases the frequency of seat belt plugging in, the noise is referred to as a negative reinforcer. There are also consequences that decrease the frequency of behaviors and these are known as punishers. The biting toddler who received a scolding was experiencing positive punishment. In operant conditioning, it's important to remember that the positive and negative do not mean good and bad. Instead, think of them as something being added or something being taken away from the situation. So when your driver's license is taken away for speeding, you've received negative punishment. Once again, we're going to come back to these terms over and over again throughout the course. Although Skinner famously used instrumental conditioning to teach pigeons to play the piano and rats to dance, the principles that he uncovered have been demonstrated to shape a large part of our lives, including our likes and dislikes. Skinner and other behaviorists were able to demonstrate this because of the controlled way in which they ran their experiments. So how do we design a good experiment? The first thing we start with is a general question about psychopathology, such as do vaccines cause autism? We then need a reliable, valid and replicable way to measure our observations. This process is known as operationalizing. The operational definition of autism spectrum disorder in DSM-5 is extensive, but it includes persistent deficits in social communication and social interaction across multiple contexts. Operational definitions are usually informed by a scientific theory. Now, a scientific theory is not the same as a hunch. A scientific theory is a detailed explanation of how and why a phenomenon occurs. It is based on multiple empirical observations and it is used to predict future occurrences of that phenomenon. So for example, the genetic theory of autism explains that the presence of certain genes significantly increases the chance of a child developing autism. The theory is then used to develop a hypothesis or testable prediction. For example, the mercury found in vaccines when used in the dosage present in the childhood vaccination schedule does not increase the child's risk of developing autism. From here, we need to design our study. The autism vaccine idea has gained a lot of ground recently, largely due to anecdotal reports and case studies. Case studies are a detailed account of a single person's experience, and because they're usually memorable, they can disproportionately influence our thinking. It's often unethical to do follow-up research on this one person, so we usually don't know the true cause of the person's symptoms. And because it's unethical to try to replicate those reported findings, we often don't know if their experience generalizes to the rest of the population. 
Case studies can be useful for identifying correlations or potential relationships between variables, but it's important to remember that correlation is not the same as causation. If a child is vaccinated and then starts showing symptoms of autism, we may be tempted to conclude that it was the vaccine that caused their autism. But it's also possible that the child's genome predisposed them to developing autism. And most of the social symptoms of the disorder just happen to present at the same time that we schedule childhood vaccinations. To gain better control of the many parameters that could influence our results, scientists often run true experiments. In our imaginary study, our cohort of children randomly selected from the population would be randomly allocated to one of two groups. An experimental group, which would receive the normal childhood vaccination schedule, and a control group, which would receive a placebo. Although it would be unethical to use this particular control with real people, placebos play an important role in psychological research because our expectations and biases can influence both the participants' experience and the experimenter's interpretation of events. When an experiment is run so that neither the participant nor the experimenter knows who's receiving the actual treatment and who's receiving the placebo, this is known as a double-blind experiment. In our imaginary experiment, the placebo would be an injection of an innocuous solution that doesn't contain mercury or any other potentially suspicious compounds. So now we have two groups that vary in terms of which injection they'll receive. This variation is known as the independent variable. You can think of the independent variable as being the thing that is manipulated by the experimenter or a grouping variable. Now, if the experimenter is grouping participants according to naturally occurring variables, like males and females, or clinically depressed and not clinically depressed, then the study is referred to as a quasi-experiment. These are pretty common in psychology because it would be unethical to deliberately give people mental illnesses. No, we can't randomly assign gender either. The experimenter then observes how this manipulation or natural grouping affects the factor that they are measuring, which is known as the dependent variable. In our imaginary experiment, the dependent variable would be autism. To be confident that our results are valid, we want to remove the influences of other factors or confounding variables. At the very least, we want to control for these variables by understanding how they have affected our dependent variable. So in our experiment, we may want to do genetic tests before vaccinating to see which of our participants have genes that are known to increase the risk of autism. If vaccinated children possess these genes and then develop autism, then we can't conclude that it was the vaccine that caused the condition because we know that there were other mitigating factors at play. After all of the children had received either the normal vaccination schedule or the same schedule of placebo injections, we would then see if there's a difference in the number of children who developed autism between the two groups. Madsen and colleagues conducted a similar quasi-experiment in 2002 and found that there was no difference in the rates of autism between children who were immunised and children who were not. If our hypothetical experiment found the same results, then we would say our hypothesis had been supported. Remember, in science, we can never prove anything to be true. We can only disprove hypotheses. This is one of the things that frustrates members of the public, but it's not to be misinterpreted as scientists not knowing anything or just making stuff up. It's simply an acknowledgement that scientific predictions about future events can at least theoretically be wrong. But every time an experimental result is replicated and the hypothesis is supported again and again, then we can be more confident that our hypothesis is probably true. Thank you for watching. Today we covered classical and instrumental conditioning, different types of studies like case studies, correlational studies, quasi and true experiments, as well as the makings of a good psychopathology experiment. Next time, we'll look at how research has put all this into practice to develop new treatments for mental illness.